I'm Sam Markell and I work on broadleaf crop diseases and of course soybeans is a big part of that. So I have a few updates for you. We're going to focus a little bit on SCN and white mold first and then depending on the time and I think in about 20 minutes we in the 20 minutes if I have a little bit more I'll talk about sudden death syndrome but primarily I want to talk about the first two. They tend to be the most problematic um, over the course of time. So we'll start with soybean cyst nematode. A few things about SCN to get going here. It is the top yield limiting pest in soybeans. So nationally, it's about a billion and a half dollars annually is lost to, lost to this parasitic worm. The name of the parasitic worm is Heteroterglycina. So if you've ever heard of HG types, that's where that comes from, uh, but it, it's a parasitic worm. It infects soybeans and dry beans, all the rest of the crops that we grow in the state it's not an issue. It really is a soybean issue and a dry bean issue emerging. So it's invasively and actively expanding. I'll give you an update on the maps and it's soil borne. So the way it expands is that moves by anything that moves soil. It's favored by high pH and dry conditions. And certainly we have some areas of high pH and in the last couple of years we've had dry conditions. So we know that there's been some pretty high SCN levels that have been popping up. The last and maybe one of the most important things if you're out west is that you don't have to have above ground symptoms until it's pretty bad. So typically we talk about a 15 to 30 percent yield hit before you start to see that stunting and yellowing. So it's one of these things that's kind of a sleeper. All right, so this is invasive and many of you know this. This came for least it was first identified in North Carolina in the 1950s and once it got to North Carolina, it got to that boot heel of Missouri really, really quickly, probably with moving soil on equipment or something like that. But as you know, that that boot heel of Missouri, that Mississippi Valley, um, Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, there's a lot of soybeans there. And it didn't take long for it to take hold and really spread throughout the entire U.S. and into Canada. And currently in North Dakota, we believe there's 24 counties that have at least had it or had an occurrence. Um, I'm going to show you some maps and talk a little bit about egg counts. And egg counts are what we care about when we're trying to detect it or when we're trying to manage it. Uh, egg counts are like your indicator of how severe the infestation is. And to just give you an idea of what egg counts will do, Berlin Nelson, who's a soybean pathologist who now just recently retired, did a lot of experiments shortly after SCN was found in North Dakota. And he did a lot on dry beans as well. And this is a good illustration of what these egg counts actually mean. So keep in mind, this is greenhouse, a little bit artificial, right? But he's growing these different pinto plants in pots with known levels of egg counts, so known eggs. So the control here has nothing, right? So no eggs, center, center plant. Looks good, healthy bean, is what you'd expect. On the other one side of your screen, you see 5,000 egg counts per 100 cc's, and you can see that plant doesn't look so hot, but it still doesn't look terrible. At 10,000, though, your the bean looks like it was planted, you know, a month later or something. It's just this is a parasite, and it's just sucking nutrients and water right out of the plant through the root. So it's just like having a like a human tapeworm, right? It's the same kind of thing. It just takes energy. It's not going to kill you because that would kill it too, but it's going to sap your energy. So just keep this in mind, keep that 10,000 eggs and keep that control plan in mind in particular as I show you what we're doing. So the North Dakota Soybean Council has a sampling program, and I'll explain these colors in a second, but this is a grower-based program. So growers or consultants or those in the egg industry can get these sample bags from any county office or from me or the Soybean Council, take soil samples, which is what we recommend, and then send it into the lab and they'll get their data back and the cost is covered by the soybean checkoff. The soybean council just covers all the lab fees. And then I get anonymous data, I get a GPS coordinate and I get egg counts and then we can map this. So this has been going on for a decade now and how you interpret this map is all these black circles are zeros, these are negatives. And those little gray boxes, that would be 50 to 200 eggs I would view that as inconclusive. So there's a dilution factor and there's some reasons for this inconclusivity, but at the end of the day, there's other nematodes in the soil that lay eggs. And so the gray boxes can be real or they can be 
not real, you know, false positive. So they're inconclusive. But then you get into these colored shapes, and we expect any of these to be accurate. So really low level positive would be that green triangle. That blue circle, it, that's definitely a positive. That's a lot of egg counts. And by the time you get to the yellow, you're over 10,000. So 10,000 was that pot that I just showed you. And the old University of Minnesota recommendations, more or less 10,000, you need to get away from soybeans for a while. Even your best resistant varieties are going to take yield hit. And then that red shape is 20,000 plus. Okay, so this is cumulative over the last decade. But this last year, a few things showed up. So the first is there's a positive here in Kidder County. Okay, that wasn't there. And there wasn't any sampling anywhere near that. But there's SCN there. There's another one here. So here you've got a pretty good high level positive in Stutzman County. And again, before this, there was no sampling, at least that I'm aware of, you know, within 20, 30 miles of that. There's another new find. So this is up in the, the Northern Valley and that yellow box is, is 10 to 20,000. That's a pretty hot find. And it, it, there was sampling before that, but there wasn't any positive like this. And then the other one that sticks out to me is another hot spot in Barnes, <clears throat> excuse me. So, so soil sampling is really important and these are being found in areas where there really wasn't a lot of map density and there wasn't a lot of known occurrences of SCN. Now, on the flip side, there was a ton of sampling here up in this kind of soybean, dry bean growing area, particularly in Benson County. So almost all of them, actually all of them this year were negative. So there was over 20 samples that were pulled and there's just not a lot of SCN up there. We think it's up there. You know, we got a couple of green triangles from the past, but there's just not a lot. So it's a good reason to sample to get in there you know, you never know for sure if you have or you don't. Soil sampling can help give you that indication. Okay, taking a look at this a different way. So this is all the samples that have been collected since 2013 in the sampling program. On average, there's five to 600 submitted a year, but the Soybean Council will cover more. And I, I point to the 2022 data. This is a, as of November 21st, there's probably more samples that have been processed since that time. So the numbers have been artificially depressed. But I want you to take a look at some of the sample density, right? So you got these, these really the dark column, that's the zeros. So if you look at 2022, there's about half, about 150 of those samples are zeros, and that's good. And then there's another chunk that are those gray boxes that are those kind of inconclusive. So it is the minority of samples that are positive, um, but the positive levels when we get them tend to be pretty high. So I would encourage everyone to sample, if, especially if you're out north or west and you've not sampled before, take a look. But if you're managing it, then I would encourage you to sample because if you get a really high egg count and you're doing management techniques that you think work, like a resistant variety you really like, and it's not happening, that's a red flag and it might be time to switch it up. So we're gonna talk a little bit about management here in a second. So the most common symptom for SCN is a really healthy looking soybean field. I took this picture a few years ago in Richland County. This is literally a hundred paces from where we had a, a seed treatment and a variety trial for SCN. It just, it just really looks pretty good. You just don't see a lot of symptoms until you're taking a pretty good yield hit. So this is across the field in Richland County, and this is an area of different variety. It's not being managed very well. And um, you know, there's there's at least 30% yield loss in that in that lens, but the whole field is likely invested. Okay, so managing SCN. So I'm gonna put up QR codes throughout this presentation, and then I'm gonna put the QR codes up on the last slide. So if you can't grab the QR code, um, you'll see it again. So the first thing is that the scncoalition.com is a really large public-private partnership that talks about all kinds of things managing SCN. And I'll come back just a little bit to that, but this is a really good resource. What we would recommend for SCN is four things. Test your field to know your numbers. First, to detect it. If you've never sampled before, take a look and see if it's there. But then if your management tools are working or not, and then rotating resistant varieties, rotating to non-host crops, 
And at some point, considering using a nemata, nemata, nematode protected seed treatment. So one tool that you could use comes in the variety trial booklet that Hans Kendall puts together. And Carrie Miranda is the breeder. She's got a lot of tables and data in there, but there's other people that contribute to that. And I'll put the QR code up here for a little bit, but this, I wanna point your eyes to table five. Sorry. Sorry about that. So table five in that booklet has, is a variety trial. There's actually three of them on SCN ground. And what I'm doing is I'm putting the average yield of all those varieties that you can see on the bottom on this histogram, okay? These are all resistant varieties. They're all marketed as resistant varieties. They all, to my knowledge, have PI88788 resistance, okay? But they're not all created equal. So there is, there is a variability in this resistance. And it's because the resistance is complicated. There's multiple genes in that source resistance and there's multiple copy numbers. Okay, so this is not a giant data set and certainly not all the varieties we have in North Dakota, but I want you to take a look that there is a lot of variability. Okay, it goes from basically 35 bushels to 65 bushels and they're all resistant varieties. So there's something that we did with a couple of these and we looked at how well the nematode actually reproduces on four of these different varieties. And we calculated something called the female index, okay? So here's three of the varieties that we took a look at. And this female index is roughly 50 to 70%. Now, what that means is that even though these varieties are labeled with resistance and have 8878 as a source, the nematode is still able to reproduce on them. And it's probably just because in the breeding process, some of these varieties lost some copy numbers or genes. At the end of the day, they're just not as robust, okay? Here's one that is really robust. So a variety is considered resistance if the female index is less than 10%. And here you have a resistant variety. So this is pretty labor intensive. It takes months to do in the greenhouse. And we don't have data for all of this, but I wanna, I wanna emphasize that the variability here in these trials is largely related to how well that resistance is working. So if there's a variety you're interested in this table, try to get it on the resistance side if you've got SCN. The variability of resistance in, in soybeans is real and it's unfortunate. And um, it's one of the, and we don't know the answers to all of them, but it is one of the reasons that if you have a resistant variety, put it in the ground and it's not yielding the way you think or your egg count is really high, get rid of it, switch to a different variety because that resistance might not be holding. So that performance trial, so this, this booklet that Hans put together that has Carrie Miranda, the breeder's data that is available here. You can click on that QR code and again, it's table five. Another thing I thought I'd mention is the ability of SCN to survive and what crop rotation does. So we, we recommend rotating to a non-host top or non-host crop, right? So anything but soybeans or dry beans. So here is some old data that Berlin Nelson did right after SCN was found in North Dakota. So the bigger the bar, the higher the egg counts. So you can see on that scale, it goes from zero to 40,000, that's a lot. And that is found at the end of the season. So in 2006, there was a susceptible soybean crop Berlin went in and he soil sampled and he found that about 37,000 eggs under that susceptible soybean crop. So then they, the grower planted wheat in 2007 and sampled at the end of the season. And that egg count had dropped by like 60%. And then another series of wheat and another cycle of wheat dropped again about 50, 60%. And then by 2009, it wasn't dropping much anymore. But the name of the game here is keeping your egg levels low and so when you rotate, you're going to get a good drop in egg levels for the first year and probably the second year too. After that, it kind of gets into the land of diminishing returns. But if you have really high SCN, rotating out of soybeans for a year or preferably two can really help you out. The last tool I'm going to talk about for managing SCN is seed treatment. So there are a lot of seed treatments on the market and we are collecting and we, meaning myself and colleagues across the US, 
we're collecting data on these every year, but they, but there are new products coming and there are, there are old products getting pushed out. I'm not going to go through a bunch of data, but this data is going to be available and I'm going to be working on this this winter. I want to make a couple points though. The first is that there is more variability in how these things work, the mode of action, than anything I've probably ever worked with. You have true nematicides here, you have fungicides, uh, you have biologicals, you have biological parasites, you have things that induce a plant defense, which are none of the above that I just mentioned. So I don't know that I'm comfortable saying, yeah, seed treatments are great, seed treatments are terrible, they work, they don't work, because they're so highly variable in their mode of action. I do believe that there will be a home for these in situations, and it's something that you want to consider if you've got high SCN in particular, but you got to do your homework on these. And we are we are working to try to help you with information. Um, there's no silver bullet here. That's just not the way they're designed. And so rotation of resistance and rotation of non-home crops is really important. They are the two main tools, but seed treatments probably have a place here, but you'll want to do some homework. Okay, the SCN Coalition I mentioned earlier is a really large public-private partnership where you can get tons of information. I would recommend you go to this thing called Let's Talk Toads. There's a series, there's 30 three-minute videos. So there's 30 videos, three minutes each, that they address all kinds of different management things. So they'll, many of these, you go in the field with a grower or somebody from a, a board or somebody from a university or company, and you talk about what's going on with SCN and how people are managing it or what they're seeing. There is a collection from different states. There's actually five now. There's a research one in Georgia, um, but there, there are some videos from North Dakota as well. So take a look. Again, there's that QR code and that's my cliff notes on managing SCN. Okay, we're gonna switch to mite mold a little bit more quickly here. So. White mold, everyone knows, very common disease. It's caused by sclerotinia sclerotiorum, and that's the same pathogen that infects white mold in all these other crops as well, all the broadleaf crops. And it survives for many, many years, and is favored by cool and wet weather. We haven't been cool and we haven't been wet, but this thing will survive, so don't forget about it. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the work that's been done at Carrington in a minute, but just as a reminder, the sclerotia are these black structures and they'll, they'll survive for many years. So right now there's sclerotia, even if not from last year or the year before, that are surviving in the soil. And they will pop up these, these little tiny mushrooms, and they are the things that produce the spores. And you need some water before bloom to get these things kicking up. So the pathogen will cause infection when it's blooming. And so this is a sunflower. It doesn't, those spores don't impact the plant directly. They, they need that flower petal. And that's really, really important because that has a lot to do with our spray timing and how we manage this thing. Once it infects the flower, it just grows into the healthy tissue and it pretty much can't stop it. And of course, this is what you see when you get a lot of white mold. Plant-to-plant -plant spread is a real thing, but we don't see it all that much. And usually it happens late in the season, but sunflowers are so visual. This is a great example of an infection in a stem that goes into the leaf, but it all starts with that flower petal. Okay, so Michael Bunch has a tremendous amount of work that he's been doing and he's updating the website. There is a lot of stuff there and I really strongly encourage you to take a look at some of this. I'm gonna talk about two things here real briefly, more to show you how to interpret what you're gonna see when you go to the website, but I'll make a few points along the way. So the first is Michael's been doing a lot of work on droplet size. Okay, and, and this is a complicated table. So I'm gonna walk you, I'm gonna walk you through that. So here he's using T jets and he's looking at droplet, droplet size ratings. And I can't quite see the top of that bar because of the zooming, but that's that's okay. So let's take a look at this table. It's separated into four mm, columns. Okay. So let's highlight the first one here. In this column, all the data would be an average of 75% or less canopy closure, okay? So there's canopy closure is what the four columns are looking at, right? So he's putting all these fungicides down at R2. All right, within this column, there's going to be three different types of droplet size. So you have fine, medium, and coarse, okay? So it's separated through the red lines. 
And within each of those, you're going to have a data point from a specific trial, and that's the blue circle. Now, the mean of that is this blue line, right? So you have this average of what happened. Okay. So in this particular case, wide open canopy, wide open canopy, the fine, medium, and coarse droplets, they all statistically performed about the same, with maybe the fine droplets being a little bit higher in yield. Okay. When the canopy starts to close a little bit more, so 80 to 89% closed, the yield gets higher if you go to a medium droplet. And by the canopy getting really close to close or closed, you are definitely increasing your yield with a coarse droplet. And the idea here is that once the canopy gets close to closing, you need those bigger droplets to penetrate in and, and get that chemical where it needs to be. And look at the difference in the yield between these two coarse ones and the finer medium. I mean, that's that's three or four bushels different just by putting on a different droplet. That, that's that's a lot of money. That That is remarkable. So what Michael would recommend is that fungicides and coarse droplets optimize the application when the canopy is closed or near closing. But if it's not closed or near closing, switch to a medium. He did the same thing with Wilters, and the same pattern is true, although very coarse droplets were better when the canopy is closed and coarse were better when it was open. This research is ongoing. All right, I have just a couple minutes left, and I think, Greg, I'm going to show you an efficacy example. Is that okay? About two minutes? Yes. Okay. Michael has a ton of this information. What he's doing is he's comparing chemicals head to head. Okay. He'll give you a summary slide. And then he will look at white mold percentage and yield against these locations. So there's three locations here and against all these different product comparisons. And it takes you a second to digest it. But the biggest thing is that the bigger the bar, the higher the yield. Now, in this particular case, if you look at this, you can see some statistical differences. I picked two very good products, Propulse and Endura, and they're basically the same. But that is not the case for many of his evaluations. Okay, so I am going to go to the last little slide here and give you some QR codes. So the SCN Variety Trial and the SCN Coalition are on the left. Michael's data is top center. And then there's two other resources that you might consider checking out. So I'm assuming there's no time for questions, but I will be here for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm.